The psalmist says, if you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, that you may be feared. O Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is plentiful redemption. We're going to begin by singing a version of that Psalm 130. It's in our books at uh, number 130. Lord, from the depths of shame and sorrow, from my guilt and my despair, I cry to you for mercy. Be attentive to my prayer. Number 130.
Well, let's join our hearts together in prayer. Let's pray. Lord our God, we come before you this morning echoing the words of the psalmist. For if you should mark iniquities, who could stand ever before you? For you are the holy God, the almighty, the glorious one of heaven, the God who made us, the God who commands us. And yet we have so perpetually and so perversely scorned you and failed you and dishonored your name. And yet it is to you that we come, the God who has not abandoned us, not forgotten us, the God who has drawn near to us, even in our weakness and despair, to be our Savior and to give us hope and life. All our hope is in your word alone. The word that can give us joy, joy in your presence, even in the face of all our sin and iniquities, joy inexpressible. And so we come to you, Lord, you who are our God from everlasting to everlasting. And we cry to you afresh, open our eyes that we might behold wondrous things in your law so that we might rejoice in your great mercy and love that we find there. Incline our wayward hearts to your testimonies and not to selfish gain. Turn our eyes from worthless things and give us life in your ways. O oh Lord, great and gracious, who is always more ready to hear than we are to pray, and I want to give more than either we desire or deserve. Pour out of the abundance of your mercy the forgiveness of your grace. Forgiving us the things that make our consciences afraid. Giving us the good things for which we are not worthy to ask. But which you do give and have given and will give through the glorious mediation of Jesus Christ, your Son, our great Savior and Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen. Well, a very warm welcome indeed to uh, all of you here this morning, very especially if you're visiting with us. And uh, if it's your first time here, then let me welcome you very particularly uh, in the name of the Lord Jesus and of uh, our fellowship here. Whether you're up here, I can see you. Whether you're downstairs in the overflows, I hope you feel very welcome and at home with us. And uh, we look forward to meeting and greeting you after the, the service. You should have one of these uh, sheets on your uh, seat. I see there are other sheets too. I think our projector is uh, still playing up, so you'll need that uh, a bit later. But uh, these yellow sheets have notices for us this week. And um, as always, there's a list in the middle of the various events going on this week. If you'd like to find out more about any of those, please ask me or one of the folk on duty today. We'll be glad to tell you. Um, do remember, if you look under Wednesday, Wednesday evening is our fortnightly uh, congregational prayer meeting. We gather all together to pray uh, here in this building. Please do come along and join us, 7.30. We pray, we pray ranging around the world for our many mission partners uh, throughout the world, throughout Scotland, the UK, uh, and of course for our own work here. Really is the heart of the, the, the uh, fellowship and the work of our uh, church here. So do come uh, on Wednesday. Let me point up a couple of things on the right-hand side. Um, two special Sundays uh, for prayer. The first is next Sunday, the 23rd. Um, our evening service, which is normally in Bar Street here, will not be here. We're going to be at Kelvin Grove so that we can be all together in one room. We have uh, many baptisms taking place, many uh, joining our fellowship also by profession of faith, and so uh, we want to be all together so we can uh, share in that joy. So do make every effort to come next uh, Sunday evening. If you have difficulty getting there because your bus only comes to the city center or whatever, uh, you'll see there we'll have some lifts from the church here. So if you uh, come along a bit early, come by six, and uh, somebody will gladly give you a lift just along the road uh, to, to the Kelvin Grove building. So that's next Sunday evening. 
not in the notice sheet, but very much in our minds and in our thoughts and I trust in our prayers, is that the following Sunday we begin our new uh, location with the 4.30 uh, afternoon service, uh, which is going to be uh, down at Queen's Park, the beginning of our new Tron at Queen's Park congregation. So next Sunday evening will be a time when not only do we rejoice in the uh, professions of faith and new members, but also we commit to God and uh, we uh, lay before God all that we seek to be doing uh, in this new gospel plant uh, at, uh, at Queen's Park. So uh, a special time. Please do uh, have that in your prayers. Uh, there are various folk who are involved in being committed to, to serving there. They're getting ready and getting organized. And uh, there's much to do still just in these last two weeks. So please, uh, very much, let's as a fellowship have that uh, in our prayers. I'll leave you to read the rest of these notices, but just to add one other, and that is the joyful news that Andrew Patrick McCutcheon was born just a few minutes after midnight this morning, and uh, all seems to be well with mother and son, and uh, hopefully with father as well. <laughs> so we delight in a new McCutcheon, terrifying thought though it may be. Well, we're going to turn to our Bibles and to God's Word now as we read together in the book of Nehemiah, where we've been studying, uh, Nehemiah chapter 9. If you have one of our visitor's Bibles, that's page 404, page 404, and we come to this long chapter, but a very, very remarkable chapter indeed. Last time, remember, we were studying chapter 8, this extraordinary chapter about the releasing of God's Word among His people. It's the people all throughout the Feast of Tabernacles read and studied and heard and understood uh, the law of God, the whole of uh, the law of Moses. And now in chapters 9 and 10 we come to the response to the receiving of that Word and what it results in among God's people. Now on the 24th day of this month the people of Israel were assembled with fasting and in sackcloth and with earth on their heads. And the Israelites, the seed of Israel, separated themselves from all foreigners and stood and confessed their sins and the iniquities of their fathers. And they stood up in the place and read from the book of the law of the Lord their God for a quarter of the day. For another quarter of it they made confession and worshipped the Lord their God. On the stairs of the Levites stood Yeshua, Bani, Kadmiel, Shebaniah, Buni, Sherebiah, Bani, and Shenani, and they cried with a loud voice to the Lord their God. Then the Levites, Yeshua, Kadmiel, Bani, Hashabaniah, Sherebiah, Hodiah, Shebaniah, and Petheliah said, Stand up and bless the Lord your God from everlasting to everlasting. Blessed be your glorious name, which is exalted above all blessing and praise. You are the Lord, you alone. You have made heaven, the heaven of heavens, with all their host, the earth and all that is on it, the seas and all that is in them. And you preserve all of them. And the host of heaven worships you. You are the Lord, the God who chose Abraham and brought him out of Ur of the Chaldeans, and gave him the name Abraham. You found his heart faithful before you, and you made with him the covenant to give his offspring the land of the Canaanite, the Hittite, the Amorite, the Perizzite, the Jebusite, and the Girgashite. And you have kept your promise, for you are righteous. And you saw the affliction of your fathers in Egypt, and heard their cry at the Red Sea, and performed signs and wonders against Pharaoh and all his servants and all the people of his land. For you knew that they acted arrogantly, presumptuously against our forefathers. And you made a name for yourself, as it is to this day. You divided the sea before them so that they went through in the midst of the sea on dry land. And you cast their pursuers into the depths as a stone into mighty waters. By a pillar of cloud you led them in the day, and a pillar of fire in the night to light for them the way in which they should go. You came down on Mount Sinai and spoke with them from heaven and gave them right rules and true laws, good statutes and commandments. And you made known to them your holy Sabbath and commanded them commandments and statutes and a law by Moses your servant. You gave them bread from heaven for their hunger 
and brought them water out of the rock for their thirst. And you told them to go in to possess the land that you had sworn to give. But they and our fathers acted presumptuously, arrogantly, and stiffened their necks and did not obey your commandments. They refused to obey and were not mindful of the wonders you performed among them. But they stiffened their neck and appointed a leader to return to their slavery in Egypt. But you are a God ready to forgive, gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and did not forsake them. Even when they had made for themselves a golden calf and said, This is your God who brought you up out of Egypt and had committed great blasphemies, you in your great mercies did not forsake them in the wilderness. The pillar of cloud to lead them in the way did not depart from them by day, nor the pillar of cloud by night to light for them the way by which they should go. You gave your good spirit to instruct them and did not withhold your manna from their mouth and gave them water for their thirst. Forty years you sustained them in the wilderness and they lacked nothing. Their clothes did not wear out and their feet did not swell. And you gave them kingdoms and peoples and allotted to them every corner. So they took possession of the land of Sion, king of Heshbon, the land of Og, king of Bashan. You multiplied their children as the stars of heaven and you brought them into the land that you had told their fathers to enter and possess. So the descendants went in and possessed the land and you subdued before them the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites, and you gave them into their hand with their kings and the peoples of the land that they might do with them as they would. And they captured fortified cities and a rich land and took possession of houses full of all good things, cisterns already hewn, vineyards, olive orchards, fruit trees in abundance. They ate and were filled and became fat and delighted themselves in your great goodness. Nevertheless, they were disobedient and rebelled against you and cast your law behind their back and killed your prophets who had warned them in order to turn them back to you. And they committed great blasphemies. Therefore you gave them into the hand of their enemies who made them suffer. And in the time of their suffering they cried out to you and you heard them from heaven. And according to your great mercies, you gave them saviors who saved them from the hand of their enemies. But after they had rest, they did evil again before you. And you abandoned them to the hand of their enemies so that they had dominion over them. Yet when they turned and cried to you, you heard from heaven. And many times you delivered them according to your mercies. And you warned them in order to turn them back to your law. Yet they acted presumptuously and did not obey your commandments, but sinned against your rules, which if a person does them, he shall live by them. And turned a stubborn shoulder and a stiffened neck and would not obey. Many years you bore with them and warned them by your spirit through your prophets, yet they would not give ear Therefore you gave them into the hand of the peoples of the lands. Nevertheless, in your great mercies, you did not make an end of them or forsake them. For you are a gracious and merciful God. Now therefore, O God, the great, the mighty, the awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love, let not all the hardship seem little to you that has come upon us, upon our kings, our princes, our priests, our prophets, our fathers, and all your people since the time of the kings of Assyria until this day. Yet you have been righteous in all that has come upon us. You have dealt faithfully, and we have acted wickedly. Our kings, our princes, our priests, and our fathers have not kept your law, 
or paid attention to your commandments and your warnings that you gave them, even in their own kingdom, enjoying your great goodness that you gave them, and in the large and rich land that you set before them, they did not serve you or turn from their wicked works. But we are slaves this day in the land that you gave to our fathers to enjoy its fruit and its good gifts. Behold, we are slaves, and its rich yield goes to the kings whom you have set over us. Because of our sins, they rule over our bodies and over our livestock as they please, and we are in great distress. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Well, we sing now the hymn on the screens that reflects surely the attitude of all of us as we read these words and as we think of our own hearts. As we come before this God to pray, we feel our sins will make him turn away. And yet we long to know that we have been forgiven. You'll find it on the sheets, I hope, on your chairs if you can't see one of the screens and we sing together. Well, as the musicians play quietly now, our offerings for the Lord's work are received. You might like to use the time to be quietly in prayer yourself, or perhaps to read again over these words that we'll be studying together shortly. But as we do that in the quiet, our offerings are received.
Let's pray together. Oh Lord our God, there's so much in this world as we look at it that alarms us, that discourages us, fills our hearts often with fear, with perplexity. How thankful we are we come before you, the God who is everlasting to everlasting, the one whose glorious name is exalted above all blessing and praise, who rules this world and every world because you have made this world and every world. And into your hands, therefore, we come and we place all our concerns. And into your hands, we bring all our petitions. We think of the ongoing conflict in Syria with all its misery and devastation. We think of the increasing tension that there is between the great powers of this world centered upon that conflict and others in the Middle East, the saber rattling on various sides. We think, Lord, of the constant news stream from across the Atlantic about the American elections with all the unsavoriness and all the foreboding that that surely strikes into our hearts. We read the headlines every day of the supposed increasing tensions and conflicts surrounding all that our country faces in the years to come with its disengagement from the European Union. In every place around the world, we see such evidence of instability, of fracture, of selfishness, and of distrust, and even of hatred. How much we need your help, O oh God, in this planet. How much we're conscious, even as your people, of the help that we need in our own lives and in our church life as we seek to look to you to guard us, to keep us, to lead us, to give us hope in this dark world. We're so conscious, Lord, of our own inadequacies, our own sin, our own failures. But all our hope is in you. And so, Lord, we throw ourselves upon you with glad thanksgiving for all that you have done for us, that in the midst of so much inadequacy, you have showered upon us so much great blessing. We pray, Lord, that you would continue to be our helper and our strength, that you would bless greatly and abundantly these efforts at new gospel planting in the congregation to begin at Queen's Park in a couple of weeks' time. We pray that next Sunday evening will be an enormous encouragement as we see so many who have come to faith in you through the glorious power of the gospel of your Son, and many also who have come here and want to join with us and partner with us in the work that you've given us to do. We pray, Lord, that as we look ahead to these new tasks that you've brought into our, play, into our lives, that these things would encourage us to know that you are the God who supplies and you are the God whose promises never fail. Turn our eyes, we pray, O oh God, to your great goodness, to your wonderful provision, to your great keeping, to all that you have done for us in our past and for all that we can therefore rely upon you for the future. May we be a people whose eyes are opened to your greatness, your glory, your power, your majesty, all made known to us in your great and abiding mercy in Jesus Christ, your Son. And so, Lord, as we come to this great chapter that speaks of the unadulterated sinfulness of your people met with the unshakable glory of your grace and mercy, May our hearts be open to receive your word and to respond as people of true faith and therefore of true prayer that we might be strong for Jesus Christ in our day and in our land and that even our broken lives renewed and restored by your grace 
might shine the light of the God who is from everlasting to everlasting and in whom there is plenteous redemption that you might be known and loved and rejoiced in here in this city of ours and to the very ends of the earth. For we ask it in Jesus Christ, our Savior's name. Amen. As we come to God's word, we sing the prayer in number 572 in our hymn books. Jesus, come, for we invite you, guest and master, friend and Lord. Now, as once at Cana's wedding, speak and let us hear your word. 572. Turn with me, please, to uh, Nehemiah chapter 11. Uh, sorry, chapter 9. A chapter all about the real prayer that is a sign of true reception of God's Word. Real reformation, real spiritual renewal in God's church, whether in any congregation, any other grouping, or indeed any individual. It always begins with the Word of God when the living Word is released among God's people with power because spiritual renewal can't be manufactured it's the response to the living reality of the empowering call of God himself only a real revelation of the living God can lead to a real response of living faith and when God's word is released then the living God does reveal himself to people when God's word is spoken and taught, the voice of the living God himself is heard. And people encounter personally the living God. They cannot not respond. They may reject his word. It is as Paul says, 
uh, for them, it is the stench of death. It is a fragrance of death unto death. Or they will receive the word as a fragrance of life to life. And so receive him and answer his personal call into a renewed and living relationship with him, the living God. And when that is so, when God's word is truly received, always the reality of that new and renewed real relationship is clear and it's obvious in tangible ways. Real and living faith can be heard and it can be seen. It's heard in real prayer, which is the audible sign of real and living faith. Remember Saul of Tarsus, after he met the risen Christ on the road to Damascus, God said to Ananias, you'll see him, behold, he is praying. Because for the first time in his life, his prayer is real. He now knows God truly in Jesus Christ. Real faith is heard in real prayer, and also it is seen in Real obedience, the obedience of faith, which, according to Jesus, is the only kind of real and living faith. Blessed are those who hear the word of God and do it. My mother and sister and brothers are those who hear the word of God and do it. Real spiritual reformation and renewal comes when, in response to the releasing of God's word, there is a receiving of God's word, as evidenced by a renewal of the audible prayer of real faith and renewed and visible obedience of real faith. And it is a wonderful example of exactly that uh, that we see in Nehemiah chapters 8 to 10. Last time we saw in chapter 8 the releasing of God's word afresh among the returned people of Israel. As Ezra and his colleagues taught them God's word day after day and as the whole congregation understood it. And what we now see in chapters 9 and 10 is the tangible evidence of a people receiving God's word in a renewed expression of real prayer, as we see here in chapter 9, and a renewed commitment to real obedience, as we'll see in chapter 10. Now, these events, of course, happened many centuries ago, centuries before even the coming of Jesus. And no doubt it was a vital time in the life of God's people. It was a, a, a vital phase in the unfolding story of the kingdom of God. But, of course, these events were recorded and written down. Why was that? Well, obviously Ezra and Nehemiah and the others who, uh, who preserved this account, they felt it mattered much to teach the coming generations about uh, what their pattern of spiritual life ought to be. But what about us? Surely as Christians, we are way, way further on than all of these people. We live in a new era. We've moved into new covenant times. We live in the end of the ages, the time of fulfillment, the age of the Spirit. Surely, surely there's nothing for us to learn from something so, so long ago. Well, not so, says the Apostle Paul. Very frequently indeed, he says that. Never. God has preserved all of these scriptures to make us wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus and that we might be equipped for every good work in the church today. Moreover, he says that all these things that happened to the Old Testament people of God took place as examples for us. And they were written down, he says, for our instruction, even though we do live in these last days after Christ's coming. And we, says Paul, we are not to be presumptuous to think that we don't need both these encouragements and these same warnings. Do you and I no longer need to heed what it really means to be receiving the word of God as a congregation of God's church today? Do we not need that? Do we not need to learn still what real spiritual reformation and renewal looks like and sounds like? If we think that, Paul says to us, be careful, lest any of you who think you stand have a great fall. Don't think that we are somehow living beyond the need to learn humbly and deeply from the lives of all of these saints who went before us and to learn what it means to be a people truly receiving the word of God. So we're going to heed Paul's admonition and we're going to turn to this chapter which has much to teach us about real prayer. The prayer that is always the sign of real renewal from a people who are truly receiving the word of God. It teaches us how real prayer is expressed, how it's elicited, how it encourages us as it records this people here 
in their renewed confession to God and in their renewed consciousness of God. And that's what gives them their renewed confidence in God. First look at verses 1 to 5 because we witness here a renewed confession to God. Real prayer is expressed in new and real confession to God. In the response to the revelation of his living presence in his word, we confess our real guilt in the face of his great mercy. Verse 3, they stood up in their place and read from the book of the law of the Lord their God for a quarter of the day. And for another quarter of it, they made confession and worshipped the Lord their God. And once again, the revelation of God's word and the response of God's people is being taken very, very seriously. A quarter of the day listening to God's word proclaimed. A quarter of the day responding in prayer. Verse 1 tells us it was the 24th of the month. That's um, uh, uh, just a day after the Feast of Tabernacles had finished. It began on the 15th, lasted for eight days, and uh, here we are then, beyond that. And remember, the feast, as we saw, had been all focused on joy, on feasting, not fasting. Because, of course, they wanted the people to learn the great truth that indeed it is in rediscovering obedience to God's Word that is the way of joy and delight in the spiritual life. That's the message, isn't it? All the way through that great long psalm, 119. All the way through it has those two prayers. Lord, give me understanding of your word. And so, give me life in all its fullness. Open my eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of your law. But of course, when our eyes are open to God's law, we also see the woeful reality of our own sinfulness, don't we? So the psalmist also tells us we must pray, incline my heart to your testimonies and not to selfish gain. Turn my eyes from looking at worthless things and give me life in your ways. I've got those words sitting in front of my face at my desk. So I see them every single morning of my life because I need to pray them every day of my life. And so do you. And so God's revelation will always bring us both a response of real rejoicing in him and a response of real repentance from us towards him. And notice here what such real repentance and real confession looks like, verse 2. It involves, doesn't it, a costly separation from sin as well as a corporate confession of sin. The Israelites, literally the seed of Israel, separated themselves from all foreigners. That, this is not about xenophobia. This is not about being arrogant in any way. You remember back at the end of chapter 6, they were only too glad to be wrapped up in all kinds of lucrative business models and family relationships with the enemies and the peoples all around them, the foreigners. That's the whole point. No, they're God's seed. They cannot be tangled up in their lives with the seed of the serpent, with a world that is opposed to and hates the one true God. Paul says exactly the same thing to the church in Corinth. You cannot drink the cup of our Lord and the cup of demons. There must be a separation. No, real repentance towards God always means a costly separation from sinful entanglements in this world. Wrong relationships, however profitable they might be, socially, financially, sexually. And notice the corporate nature of this confession, do you see? They confessed together their sin and the iniquities of their fathers. See, there was no hiding it away in a sort of silent personal prayer. Now, this was all open. It was honest. It was real. And it's only when God's people are open and honest about the reality of their sinfulness and their real struggles, instead of, instead of keeping them under a veneer of pretense. It's only then that there's any real hope of change, isn't it? It's like, like the AA meeting. It's only when somebody has stood up and said, my name is John, and I'm an alcoholic. It's only then, isn't it, that they can begin to be any help. Well, it's just the same with any church, any fellowship of God's people. It's only when we're real with one another, when we stop pretending away the reality about our fallenness, the battles with sinfulness that we all have. It's only then that the grace and mercy of God through his people in the church, by his Holy Spirit working through his word in us, it's only then that we can begin to get real help 
real forgiveness, real renewal, and new strength and new hope. And that's why the, the, the Levites here lead this exercise in down-to-earth reckoning with reality among God's people. We're told in verse 4 they stood on the stairs. Presumably that was the stairs of that great pulpit platform we read about in chapter 8. It's an interesting detail, isn't it? Why are we told they stood on the stairs? I wonder whether in fact it somehow signifies their own solidarity with the people in their sin and in their confession. They stood on the platform with all the authority of God's word coming from above to the people. But when it came to expressing the prayer of the people, they went down on the stairs as if they were among them because they were among them. And certainly that's true, isn't it? All who teach and preach God's word must feel, and they do feel, the same convicting power acutely in their own lives. So here, verse 4, they cried out with a loud voice their prayers of, of confession to God along with all the people. But notice verse 5. Notice, even amid this great confession, it was not their sin, but it was the glorious reality of God that dominated things. The heart of all sin, of course, is personal. It's a personal offense against God, our Creator, and our Sovereign Lord. And yet here, transcending even the cries of confession is something else. As Derek Kidner says, the facts are not ignored, as the ensuing prayer will show, but they will be seen in the context of eternity and of God's unimaginable greatness. All their expression of sin has been elicited by what God's Word has been teaching them and what they've been rediscovering about the true nature of their God. This renewed and real confession is born out of a renewed and real consciousness of the God who is their God from everlasting to everlasting and of His great eternal purposes and of their extraordinary place and privilege within those everlasting purposes of grace. And so they pray and they confess their real guilt, but it's in the face of God's greatness and God's glory. And it's a greatness and a glory, do you notice, which doesn't drive them away from God's presence in panic, but draws them towards God in prayer. The rediscovery of true prayer comes from a rediscovery of the true God. But what kind of God have they discovered who makes, who makes guilt-conscious human beings full of realism about their own sin, who makes them want to pray and come to God, not that they can't come to God and can't pray? That's a real question, isn't it? A real question for you and me when we have to face the reality of the sin and the guilt and the shame in our own lives. Sometimes we feel so deeply ashamed, don't we, that as we sang... When we want to come before God, we feel it must surely turn his face away. Can I come near to God ever again? Will he ever possibly turn his face towards me now? Can he ever forgive me again? Well, if we think that, that's why verses 6 to 31 are here. Look at them. Because we see laid out this people's renewed consciousness of God. And real prayer is elicited by a renewed and real consciousness of God. In response to the self-revelation in His living presence in His Word, you see, we become conscious of His mighty grace, His mighty goodness. And that eclipses, that overwhelms even the greatest of our sin and our guilt and our utter perversity before Him. This people bless the name of the Lord, verse 5, Yahweh, their God. And they exalt his name above all blessing and praise because, verse 6, he is who he is. He is the Lord. Well, who is the Lord? Well, that's what the whole prayer tells us. It echoes so much of the language of the Old Testament, which they've rediscovered, which tells us the kind of God that the God of the Bible really is. And it's so, so important we see this because we hear today, don't we, from so many people such terrible things about the God of the Bible, especially the God of the Old Testament. He's a vicious ogre. He's a tyrant. 
He's a ghastly, malevolent force bearing down on people and their sin. Well, look at verses 6 to 15. Every single sentence has as its subject the Lord God, what he says, what he does, who he is. And these people are in no doubt that they come in prayer to a giving God whose giving is above all blessing and praise. All the focus here is on the extraordinary gifts of his creating and covenant grace. You are the Lord, verse 6, the God of creative power, the giver of all heavenly life, the giver of all earthly life. You made everything and you preserve everything. And all heaven praises you. All the extraordinary beauty and diversity and wonder of life in this world. All things bright and beautiful. All creatures great and small. All things wise and wonderful. The Lord God made them all. And the host of heaven, we're told here, sees it and marvels and worships God for all that he has done. Whereas, for the most part, the host of earth pays him no attention whatsoever. It's one of the cardinal signs, isn't it, that somebody has come to true and living faith in God when the perception of heaven becomes evident in their perception now uh, of this world and their attitude to prayer becomes full of thankfulness to God for all the abundant glory of his mercies and his creative beauty in this world. The attitude of the natural person, the worldly person, is just to blame God, isn't it? They look at the world and say, look at all these terrible things. If there is a God, it's all his fault. Isn't that right? That's the voice of the unrepentant heart. That's the voice of the self-justifying person. But the penitent heart marvels at the extraordinary mystery of God's goodness and grace to a rebellious world, to a sinful world. That he blesses everything that he has made so richly in sheer undeserved grace. But of course the believer also knows that the Lord is God not only of creative power, but he's the God of covenant promise. Verse 7, you are the Lord who chose Abraham and made a covenant to give him and his offspring a place in your presence forever. And you kept your promise for, verse 8, you are righteous. In other words, you're always faithful and true to your promised word. And when this God is your God... Verse 9, he will always be present with you as promised to see, to help you in your darkness. He's on your side against all evil, verse 10, just like he was against the Egyptian oppressors. No destroying power can pluck you from his hand. And he leads you, verse 12, night and day. His powerful presence is there to lead and to guide you. He is the God who gives and gives and gives and gives again. Not just the daily bread of earthly sustenance, verse 15, which he gave them so miraculously in the desert, but also, and of course, this was the whole point of the manna, as Deuteronomy 8, verse 3 told them. And they now obviously relearned that the heavenly word of God alone is what they needed day by day to sustain them in everlasting life. Verse 13, you came down and spoke from heaven. You gave the very words of life by Moses, your servant. He is the giving God. As Peter says, he has given us everything we need for life and godliness through the knowledge of him who has granted us great and very precious promises. When this God, when the Lord God is your shepherd, you lack nothing. He is with us. He leads us. We need fear no evil because he is our constant comfort and strength. Now, is that the God that you think of when you're very conscious of your need to confess sin, when you're perhaps fearful and you wonder if you could ever approach him and he would ever look at you? Well, if not, maybe you need to open your Bible more often at chapters like this one. Because the God of the Bible shows himself truly. And if we receive him in his word, we will see the wonder of who he really is. And that will always lead us to a renewed humility in confession of our sins. But that will never, ever be separable 
from the wonderful renewed hope that it brings us in our consciousness of the grace and the glory of the Lord who is the God of creation and the God of covenant who never fails. If it had not been the Lord who was on our side, said the psalmist, then the flood would have swept us away. But our help is in the name of the Lord who is the maker of heaven and earth, the giving God whose giving is above all blessing and praise. And as verses 16 to 31 underline so powerfully, he is the good God whose goodness is exalted above all blessing and praise. Surely the focus in these verses is on the extraordinary goodness of his covenant faithfulness that both provides for God's people and punishes his beloved people, but always in order to preserve them in his mercy, despite their presumption, despite their rebellion, despite their utter perversity. Look at verses 16 and 17. Aren't they astonishing? God gave and gave and gave promises, provision, protection, his presence in abundance. But they and our fathers acted presumptuously, stiffened their necks, did not obey, refused God. Their echidna says, throughout this miraculous pilgrimage, they lacked nothing, as verse 21 says, and they appreciated nothing. Verse 17, look, they appointed a leader to return to their slavery in Egypt. The word used in verse 16, by the way, of acting presumptuously is the same word used of the enemy Egyptians in verse 10, arrogantly. The same again in verse 29. They're just like the Egyptians. As Ralph Davis puts it, there's an Egyptian nature within Israel. Something deep within them wants to reverse God's redemption, to go back to slavery. Although, of course, they saw it not as going back to slavery, but as seeking liberation from this tyrannical God. Presumptuous, stiff-necked, disobedient. It's very strong language, isn't it? It's the language Stephen uses in Acts 7 as he rehearses the same history and says, always you resist the Holy Spirit. But that's the way of the world, isn't it? Let us throw off the yoke of this burdensome God. Let us be rulers, not God. Let us be God, not Him. Let's find a leader to take us away from the restrictive life that He wants us. Let's be led by a political ideology that promises us freedom and utopia. Let's be led by economic ideologies that promise us prosperity and wealth. Let's be led instead by sexual ideology that promises us intimacy and fulfillment and on and on it goes and friends the really chilling thing is how that Egyptian nature still bubbles up so often even in the redeemed people of God yes even in us a dark rebellious reality deep down within our nature which still causes you and me to be so perverse even though we are Christ's people, even though we want to follow him faithfully. For I do not do what I want, but the very thing I hate, cries the Apostle Paul himself. The evil I do not want, that is what I keep on doing. Though I delight in the law of God in my inner being, I see in my members another law waging war and making me a captive to the sin that dwells in my members. What a wretched man I am. That perversity is within us, isn't it? And it's evident so often within Christian churches too. Just read the New Testament. You're biting and devouring one another, says Paul to the Galatian church. I read a letter this very week from a church I know where people are biting and devouring one another. And very likely if they go on to consume one another. Sheer perversity, reversing the joy of redemption, wanting to go back into the way of this world. How can you go back, says Paul, to those weak and worthless things, to be slaves once again? Don't be submitting again to that yoke of slavery. Don't go back to Egypt. That's the letter to the Galatians in a nutshell. It's the letter of the Hebrews, the same. Don't go back. Don't be presumptuous. Don't be stiff-necked. Don't be disobedient to the gospel. Don't refuse God's commands 
for your life. But we do, don't we, you and I? We have this very week. We sin. And we sin deliberately and arrogantly, presumptuously. And every time we do, we spit in the face of God our Savior. We trample over the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we join the mockers who shout, What a waste, that's all for nothing. And we shout with them, We despise you for all that you've done. We can't read verses 16 and 17 here with all these repeating words of sinfulness without also taking the words of verse 33 on our lips with this people and admitting that we also have acted wickedly and shamefully and unforgivably. And if that's true, we say to ourselves, don't we, how can we come before our God ever again? Verse 17, but you are a God ready to forgive. Literally, it says, you are a God of forgivenesses, plural. My goodness, how we need that plural. Gracious, merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. What did we sing in Psalm 130? Let Israel hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is mercy. With him there is plenteous redemption. And verses 16 to 25 tell of his faithful patience that provides for his people, even in the face of appalling ingratitude and perversity and rank idolatry. They, verse 18, committed great blasphemies, but you in your mercies did not forsake them. Rather, he went on, look, with infinite patience, providing for their every need, leading and guiding them wherever they went, verse 19. Verse 20, instructing them by his good spirit through his word to them, sustaining them physically with food and water. Verse 22, bringing them great victories over kings to possess the land. Verse 25, look, the richness of a land full of good things, properties, vineyards, olive groves, fruit trees in abundance. Not just provision, absolute sheer prosperity. He makes them fat with delight. And notice the last line, all through your great goodness. Not ever through their goodness or faithfulness or merit. This is not the meritocracy that our Prime Minister wants us to have. Thank God. No hope for us in that with God. It's all of His goodness and grace. It's a reminder, isn't it, by the way, that all the material prosperity of the church in the West and indeed the Western word in general is not a sign of our deserving. It is not a sign of our righteousness and faithfulness. Only of God's abundant goodness. Just as the beauty and blessings of this whole world are a sign of His common grace to all. He sends the rain and the sun on the evil as well as the good. For what a God of faithful patience to provide for such a rebellious people, so ungrateful, so presumptuous. Nevertheless, verse 26, they still behaved shamefully with recalcitrant and murderous disobedience, killing God's messengers. The story's moved on here to the time of the judges and then the kings, and despite all God's warnings to turn back, they just continued to turn their backs on him. More and more and more blasphemies. And so verses 26 to 31 tell of God's faithful punishments also. But also, they are to preserve his people. They're all to turn his people back. God's patience does not mean softness. Never make that mistake. God's love is fierce and jealous for the health of his people. And so like any father, he'll chastise, he'll punish, so as not to let his offspring become feral and utterly lawless, and utterly lost, so as not to forsake them. And so in his great mercy, he preserves them, even through great punishment when they refuse to heed his word. He warned them repeatedly. Notice that, verse 26. 
and verse 29 and verse 30. Many times by his spirit he warned them in order to turn them back so they did not face calamity. God's warnings in Scripture are always merciful warnings. Wish we would understand that and recognize that. God warns us in his word, not because he hates us, not because he wants to ruin our lives, but because he wants to save us, because he loves us. God sent Jonah, remember, to the pagan city of Nineveh and said, repent or the place will be destroyed and you with it. And those pagans, they received God's word and they were saved, but not God's people, his own people. Verse 29, still presumptuous, still arrogant, still Egyptian at heart. They did evil again, verse 28. They did not obey God's commands, verse 29. They sinned against God's rules, which if a person does them, he will live by them. Notice that. This is nothing to do with works religion. This is nothing to do with justification by merit. Not at all. It's so clear here, isn't it? They chose to refuse God's spirit. They chose to refuse God's word. They chose to persist in the disobedience of unbelief rather than to humble themselves in the obedience of true faith, which is the only kind of saving faith, according to the Lord Jesus. They said, we are Israelites. We are God's people. God must be happy with us and save us. Just as the Pharisees said to Jesus, we are Pharisees. We surely are justified in God's sight. And just as Christians today sometimes say, we are evangelical. We are reformed no less. So surely God must be happy with us. No, 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 says the Bible. No, says Jesus and his apostles and every prophet and Moses. Don't say to me, Lord, Lord, and not do what I command. And when people think that, he must punish, chastise in his mercy in order to preserve them. Verse 30. He gave them into the hands of the peoples of the lands, the pagans, the enemies, the seed of the serpent, but from whom they had become indistinguishable. God gave them up. It's a chilling reminder there, isn't it, of Romans chapter 1 when God says, Paul says, God gave man up to the lusts of his own heart to allow human sin to bring judgment upon its own perpetrators. Because God's own people by nature, by themselves, are just like everyone else. We are Egyptian natured. We are by nature seed of the serpent, not the seed of the living God. Friends, if you don't really believe that, you don't think that's true, just take a long, deep look into your own heart. Doesn't it frighten you? What do you find there? Aren't you often so ashamed of the things that emerge from there into your thoughts, into your lips, into your actions? Left to ourselves, every single one of us would just merge back in with the people of the lands. But we're not left to ourselves because our God is the God of extraordinary goodness whose infinite patience provides even in our perversity and whose merciful punishments preserve us even from pride and presumption and self-determination. Look at verse 31. Nevertheless, in your great mercies you did not make an end of them or forsake them. For you are a gracious and merciful God. With him is plenteous, plenteous redemption. And you see, it was their renewed consciousness of this God who is their God, the Lord God, revealed afresh in that living encounter with him in this word and, and received in hearts of penitent faith. It was this that elicited their prayer and enabled them to pray and enabled them to express their confession of sin to God. And so be restored to him. Be renewed. Be back in fellowship with him. That's why we see in the final verses, 32 to 37, this renewed confidence in God. Because real prayer is encouraged by a new and real confidence in God in response to his revelation of himself in his word. 
because that's where we see afresh his tenacious commitment to his purposes and his tender, tender compassion to his people. Now therefore our God, they pray, to direct call to him to look on them in their own day with his mercy. See all this that has come upon us, verse 33. See it all. And what they're saying is, will you not still today be to us the God that we now know you to be, boundless in mercy, boundless in steadfast love? It's not said explicitly, but that's the clear implication of their prayer, isn't it? They have a renewed confidence, encouraged by everything that they've grasped about this God before whom they are kneeling in prayer. And they do two things. You can see verse uh, 33. First of all, they confess their unavoidable weight of sin and their part in that dreadful perversity. We have acted wickedly. Behold, we are slaves, verse 36, because, verse 37, of our sins. You see, no covering up, no special pleading, no self-justification, no saying, oh, it's all God's fault. Verse 33, see, you have been righteous in everything that has come upon us. This is not self-pity. This is the true self-knowledge that is forced upon us by the truth of God when the Spirit of God touches our hearts through His Word. But second notice, even more so, they confess aloud the unavoidable wonder of the grace and goodness of God. Verse 32, our God, the great, the mighty, the awesome God, who keeps covenant and steadfast love. In your great mercies, you did not make an end of them or forsake them. Verse 31. And this is the God that they know is their God from everlasting to everlasting. And so they know that because he is who he is, then even though they now cannot avoid knowing what they are, they know that there is still plenteous redemption. They know that there is a way back to God from the dark past of sin. That there is a door that is open that they may go in. They know because they know him the true God of heaven revealed in his glorious word to them. And friends, how much more, how much more do you and I know him? Know him who is revealed so fully and completely in our Lord Jesus Christ. Because we know, don't we, that it's Calvary's cross where you begin when you come as a sinner to Jesus. Let me draw to a close with these words. This was an act of confession on the part of God's people, and yet the predominant consciousness is not so much of their sin as of the greatness of God. They were overwhelmed by the sense of that greatness. This is the ground of all hope in spiritual life, to make this discovery. Because in biblical confession, the deepest consciousness is not, not of our sin, but of God's greatness and glory. It's possible to be morbidly preoccupied with our sins and unworthiness. But reading Paul's life and letters, how little preoccupation he had with sin. He said he was the chief of sinners, but he did not bemoan and wail his sin endlessly before God. No, his eyes were upward on the greatness of God and on the unsearchable riches of Christ. And it may be that we've yet to learn that viewing the unsearchable riches of Christ is a more health-giving act of confession of sin than morbid preoccupation with it. You see, when we turn our eyes there to the ultimate self-revelation of this God, who is our God from everlasting to everlasting, in his ultimate revelation in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, we do see there, of course, our sin, our wickedness, our perversity, our blasphemy. 
And it rightly puts us down in the dust. But more than that, far, far greater than that, overwhelmingly greater than that, inscribed upon the cross, we see in shining letters, God is love. He bears our sins upon the tree. He brings us mercy from above. And you see, it's seeing that, and it's only seeing that, that can draw us again into health-giving and life-renewing confession of our sins and our God which is the mark of real prayer. Well, let's pray. O oh Lord, our God, the great, the mighty, the awesome God who has shown yourself to us in all your radiant wonder, in all your depths of mercy, in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, in the person of your Son, and who has kept your covenant with us, sealed with blood of your own, and so redeemed us forever by your abundant and your triumphant grace. Grant us, we pray, Lord, to so receive your word that even the darkness of our sins cannot ever extinguish the brightness of your glorious goodness and the surpassing riches of your love towards us in Jesus Christ. And so that we may be strengthened with power through your Spirit in our inner being. That we might be people of real prayer. People who have received this glorious gospel of grace. And people who live to the praise of your glorious grace all the days of our lives. And we ask it for Jesus' sake. Amen. Well, we end by turning our eyes to the greatest revelation of our God in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ and praying, Jesus, keep us near the cross where a precious fountain free to all a healing stream flows from Calvary's mountain.
Israel, hope in the Lord. For with the Lord Jesus Christ there is steadfast love. With him there is plentiful redemption. He will redeem Israel from all his iniquities. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of his Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.